Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast with Josh Marshall and Kate Riga. Uh, so we lied. We lied to you. You know, we said we said last week that this was going to be a pre-recorded episode. But in fact, I mean, it's pre-recorded because I'm not like talking the second you're listening to this. But we are we are back recording on uh, our normal Wednesdays. And, you know, I'd like to put a, uh, you know, tell you a pretty story, put a pretty face on it. But but Kate Riga, I, I have to throw her under the bus. She just got the dates wrong. I'd so, like our audience yeah. to know that I told Josh he could throw me under the bus because it is my fault for getting the dates mixed up, expecting him to say, oh, Kate, you know what? You have been shouldering such a burden of late. This happens to the best of us. And like, don't even worry about it. But no, he I mean, uh, I, took me I up on to, my invitation and yeah. talked me right under I mean, those you, wheels. You say you throw you under the bus. I'm going to throw you under the bus. No so, hesitation. No yeah. pause. Well, you're you're. Our our con- conflagration here is your gain because you get another live episode, and we we are uh, Kate is is still going on vacation. So next week you will have the pre recorded episode, and then the following week after that we'll have an off week, and then we'll be back as as usual. Um, so all right, so look, we have um, we we'll get the we get the deception out of the way. We're we're deep into the debt ceiling thing now. Uh, it is May 17th as we record. As you know, we are on sort of a fuzzy deadline of June 1st uh, that could be, you know, could be June 15th. But I, I think everybody is kind of operating on the assumption now that this is something that's going to happen in early June, first half of June. So the 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 turnaround date is tight and as i mentioned a couple of days ago and you know you didn't need me to mention it it was more my kind of just saying look this is obviously happening um you get deep into this kind of this kind of question of you know what's negotiating what's not i mean by by any normal definition they're now negotiating over a debt ceiling hostage situation and uh you know, as I said in that post, in politics, you don't get everything you want. Some things don't go well, but you should at least say when they're what's happening and uh, if it was not what you hoped for or not what you expected. Yesterday, I published um, I published a bunch of reader emails and uh, it was it was it was notable to me that I think a lot of you are not sure that that is really what is happening. Um, And I I credit that in the sense that um, there's, there's always a, there's always a, uh, a kind of a balancing act that Democrats have. And that has to do with the structure of the electorate. Most of Republicans are a pretty homogeneous group, and that is what allows them to act irresponsibly, to uh, do these transgressive things, and so on and so forth, because they're all pretty much on board, and they have, um, again, that that big homogenous uh, group. Democrats tend to rely on a, a kind of middling group that uh, may support democratic policies, but is invested in, you know, kind of normy things like responsibility and not breaking things and not all, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, Democrats often have to make sure they are looking like they are the responsible party. Right now, a lot of us have concluded that that's we're kind of past that. You have to, you know, you're in a, a partisan gunfight here and you can't show up with like a back scratcher or a club or something like that. Um, in any case, uh, I think a, a lot of you are still kind of a bit uncertain of, of what is going on. Is Are they kind of negotiating with the expectation, which is not a bad expectation, that the Republican demands will be so unreasonable that they will be able to say, look, you know, we said we weren't going to negotiate. We wanted to go the extra length. We tried to cut some kind of a deal, but they're 
asking for things that are just unacceptable. And here we are. Now, uh, maybe that's totally possible. You know, I, I, I this this is this is a tough situation, and and I did a post last night just reminding everybody something that I think is is has been remarkably absent from this conversation for weeks or maybe even months now, but especially in 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 recent weeks, and that is that there's every reason to think that Kevin McCarthy is not actually empowered to negotiate anything. You know, when you have a negotiation, um, we were at TPM, we were involved in a business type negotiation <laughs> uh, uh, a little while back. And one of the things is you need people who are negotiating, who are empowered to make a deal, right? You you, you need, at, especially in the at the in the late stages of, of the process, you need two people who can come to an agreement and then deliver on that agreement. And there's every reason to think that Kevin McCarthy cannot deliver on anything. The, the people who run the uh, House Republican Caucus or the Freedom Caucus. So that introduces another, you know, another dimension of this. Having said all that, we had weeks, months of we're not neg going to negotiate over debt ceiling, hostage taking. We, you know, you have to provide a clean debt ceiling increase. And now we are negotiating. And actually, just before we um, just before we started this episode, uh, President Biden was going to do a, you know, some sort of kind of rose garden announcement about debt ceiling stuff. And as often happens, that is delayed. So, uh, you know, possibly you'll find us cut out in the middle of the episode and we'll come back and we'll know some dramatic new detail or something like that. Um, in any case, you probably know what that is. I suspect it is not a game changing thing, probably a little more, you know, positioning, trying to kind of state where things are and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to get into that. We're going to get into the whatever, you know, the Battle of Santos Hill, right? The the latest, the latest charge up the hill. And wh what's happening now, as you know, af after um, uh, months of, you know, uh, denial and shit posting and all sorts of other hijinks, uh, Santos was indicted on charges tied to three separate criminal schemes. And so now the Democrats have introduced a privileged resolution to expel him from the House. Now, priv yeah, privileged resolution, basically there are certain uh, kinds of votes you can just sort of say, we need to vote on this. And, and the speaker and the leadership, they just have to go along with it. Um, and expulsion, I guess, is one of these, you know, there's all these technical rules and everything. In any case, they're going to have that. And, you know, I mean, look, this guy, it, it's funny in normal, normally, I mean, often when someone is indicted on serious charges, they'll just resign. But there is certainly a decent argument on the merits that indictment is an accusation you're, you know, you're, you're innocent till proven guilty. Now the standard of being in public office is a bit higher, right? <laughs> than than what is required to, to uh, incarcerate you or take away your freedom. But still at a certain level, people get indicted when, you know, on things that are not true, that are not fair, blah, 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 blah. Some argument you should, you know, you get a chance to uh, defend yourself in court. And if you're indicted, that's, or I'm sorry, if you're convicted, that's usually when you go. The thing with Santos, of course, it's a, it's a little, it's a little different in as much as the indictment is almost a, how can I, I mean, how can I put it? It is, it's a bit anticlimactic. Right, we 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 know the guy is a serial liar and con man. Right, I mean everybody knows that. Okay, so he really should have been booted out or or you know had to resign or something like that already. In any case, remember that Kevin McCarthy has a four vote majority 
in the House. That is that remains a very big deal uh, on on things like the the debt ceiling, right? You, that 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 difference between three and four makes a pretty makes a pretty big difference. So he needs George Santos to stay in office. Uh, there's every this is that that district is not a totally safe Democratic district, but it's definitely a Democratic district. Um, I think you can you can be assured that Santos would probably run again in a special election, right? So there's every reason to think that he'll be replaced by a Democrat. And in the short run, McCarthy won't have that vote. In any case, we're going to get into that, all the ins and outs of how that's going. Uh, let me remind you before we uh, go any further that J- the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. Make this summer a little more chill with a bean bag bundle from Grady's Cold Brew. Each bundle makes 12 glasses of subtly sweet New Orleans style cold brew coffee for less than a buck a cup. And even though it's DIY, Grady's makes it easy to enjoy consistently great iced coffee at home. Just drop a bean bag into a glass pitcher, add cold water, and wake up to a week supply of cold brew the next morning. Ready to give it a swirl? Get 25% off at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. Again, that's Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. Okay, Kate Riga, your your shame has been revealed. We have dealt with the scheduling questions. What are we talking about on the debt ceiling? So like you say, and kind of like you've been discussing with our readers, Despite the the no negotiation hard line, I mean, they're obviously negotiating and they're negotiating specific policy proposals, which we now know are basically, you know, clawing back the COVID money, the unspent funds, um, you know, spending caps, permitting reform and adding work requirements uh, to various benefit programs. And it's the last of those that I sense is generating the most ire from both uh, Democratic politicians and, you know, constituents here, because it is, is quite kind of a leap to go from, we're not negotiating, this is a just your duty in Congress, you know, we're not going to play around, to having Biden kind of go out and publicly say, like, well, you know, I, I voted for work requirements in the 90s. I mean, could there be anything more demoralizing than that. And I think he since, because there was some progressive pushback, has come out and said, you know, I'm not going to do anything with work requirements with uh, SNAP, you know, which is what was formerly known as food stamps. He said he's not going to mess with Medicaid. He's not going to do anything that'll revoke people's health care coverage. Um, and so that kind of only leaves TAMF, which is, um, you know, cash assistance. But I think the thing that's difficult is you stake out this really hard line. And this is the line that you and I talked about being difficult to hold, right? Because the other side of it is economic calamity. So, I mean, I do understand and appreciate the difficulty of the position that they're in, because if they do hold that line, we will default. I mean, there's just, there's no way around that. Um, and perhaps if they can find some kind of painless negotiation, we have, we avert that. But the thing to me is Republicans don't actually care about these policy positions, you know, like they care insofar as demonizing the poor and welfare queens have always been politically beneficial towards them. So they're going to keep kind of like milking that, that point until it's dry. But I don't know why we think there's a world where Biden and McCarthy are going to agree on some kind of like, okay, we'll take back the unspent COVID funds. You know, we will make it easier to drill in some vulnerable part of the country. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll make it a little bit harder for people on TAMF to get those requirements. And that Kevin McCarthy can bring that back to his caucus and have like, you know, Matt Gates and Boebert be like, Awesome. Super. I love it. I mean, it's just he is not a reliable negotiating partner because his side is not reliable. I mean, it's we're operating off of the basis that the House Freedom Caucus are policy wonks who are truly just using this to try to get through policy changes that they never would otherwise when that's not what this is about these people don't care about policy you know they've kind of wrangled together something to add cover to the idea that they 
are salivating at the idea of blowing it all up, of blaming Joe Biden for exploding the economy. Like that has always been the point of this. Well, and I, the other point that you allude to is that what you just described is not their position at all. They want the whole Inflation Reduction Act rolled back. They want now it, it's you know, one, once we sort of accept we are in a negotiation, it's it's worth it, it, it you know, it's worth um, sort of arranging the different demands on a graded scale of things. And one thing, you know, there's different kind of, there's great overlap, the same, in, in almost every case, the same people oppose both. But there's some difference of emphasis uh, in different sort of parts of the Democratic Party. Obviously, the work requirements is are a very big deal for for what I would almost call people very focused on retail policy. You know, these people right here are going to lose their benefits because you're creating this work requirement that whatever the the you know, the hypothetical logic of that they're not able to to work. So you're just taking away their benefits. So that's one thing. The other thing is those caps, you know, that you're going to, that you're going to put for some number of years, you are going to just cap spending at some arbitrary level. Um, And given that there has been as, you know, as Republicans don't cease to tell us has been uh, right, there have been rising prices, cost of living, uh, prices uh, over the last uh, couple years, spending has gone up. So it it sounds when you say like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna freeze uh, freeze uh, levels at you know 2022 le- you know uh, price levels, funding levels. That doesn't sound too bad. I'm like, dude, we were just in 2022. Kind of you know, is it so bad to just kind of hold it there? Well, again, you know, 2022 stuff was done in 2021. It actually means fairly substantial cuts across the board. And again, that is sort of like, you know, wholesale policy, for lack of a better word. You that is just kind of pulling government support for the economy out of, you know, you're pulling a lot of spending out of the economy. Um, and in, on more specific senses, once you in most in most of these in most of these scenarios, you are uh you know, uh, taking out Social Security, the military, Medicare, veterans benefits. Um, And once you, that's most stuff right there. So when you say, all right, we're going to cut it, we're going to cut aggregate spending, you know, we're going to hold it at 2022 levels in 2023, 2024, and 2025. And we are going to exempt the big, you know, the big majority of what the government does. That means you end up with pretty draconian cuts of everything that's left. Everything that's left beside the military, Social Security, Medicare, veterans benefits. So those are, I think, and again, different people focus on have a little more focus on one of the other, but. To make the point, it's not like, you know, I I guarantee you, basically, everyone who's against one is against the other, just, again, points of emphasis. Uh, So you have those two things. You know, one other thing that has kind of come up, and I think it's worth noting that it used to be in, in kind of ridiculous things like this, everybody would say, well, kind of, you know, Social Security and Medicare, the military, now veterans benefits are added to that. That's new, right? That is that is a new thing um, that they are also sacrosanct. And I mean, look, I'm all for veterans benefits. I think we should have more uh, uh, more generous veterans benefits for the VA. Blah 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 blah. But again, there's there's something you know you can you can um, the argument for the military. I'm not sure it's it's how clear an argument it is in practice, but you can say, look, our adversaries aren't going to give us a timeout when we're doing these you know ridiculous budgeting high wire acts. You need the military functioning at all times. Okay, 
that's sort of, you know, that there's logic to that. But again, it's just worth noting this, this now veterans benefits, which, which are great, are merited, all power to it. It's not the military. It's not the same thing. Worth noting there. So those those are two. Those are, I think the the two points that there is going to be a lot of heartburn for Democrats if the White House thinks it has to go one of those paths or both of those paths. I the permitting reform. You know, this is another one. Permitting reform. I think it just means it makes it easier to kind of like, hey, I want to I want to dig some oil, like. <sighs> You know, in the context of all the other stuff we're doing and the fact that these things have a long half-life, you know, on the list of, of things, okay, maybe, whatever. Uh, the COVID, the unspent COVID relief money, that is the one that seems most expendable to me. Although you certainly hear a lot of people saying, well, all the things they do, they need that kind of, you know, few hundred billion sitting around to 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 work with those. I mean, those seem, those do seem less structural to me. But again, as, as, as Kate says, if you did every one of those things, caps, work requirements, scale back all the COVID money and permitting reform, the people who actually run the show in the house would say, okay, that's a good start, but are you kidding? So, uh, you know, I don't know where that's going to just because they're willing to negotiate on that, which, as we've said, I don't think they should be, but just because they they are, that really doesn't get you very close to what uh, Kevin McCarthy would need to get a debt ceiling increase through the House. So Right, you know. and this just, it continues to be such a rotten deal for Democrats because they, they accede to all those things and somehow get them through the chambers, which I honestly don't think they would be able to because we've had so many Democrats come forward, even just particularly on the work requirements and say like this, I am, this is ideologically opposed to like why I am here, why I am in Congress. I'm not going to make life harder than poor people. And I think if permitting stuff gets real, you're going to have all the climate hawks say, yeah, we're not going to make it easier to drill for oil. And it's, you know, it's hard to get mad at those people about those things because these are, you know, Republican priorities. There's a reason why they're not Democratic ones. They are ideologically completely contradictory. But even if, you know, some world where the White House agrees to all that stuff, Democrats agree to pass it and it passes and we avert the debt ceiling catastrophe, we're going to be negotiating over the budget in September. And Republicans are not going to be like, oh, well, you know, we just got some stuff, so we should be like a little more congenial this time. I mean, they're just going to go harder and they're going to take this as a signal that this White House is weak and willing to kind of let them be the terrorists here. Um, so I, it's just I don't want to come down like a hammer on the White House for being in these talks because, again, like the other side of this situation is so dire and so bad. But I just don't see how coming to an agreement here is anything but dangerous and just kind of foreshadowing more and more of these as we go on. And, you know, not just the budget stuff, but every time, every time we hit the debt ceiling, this is what it's going to be. I mean, Republicans just keep kind of learning from this and realizing that they can get what they want. That's just not a good lesson to learn. And it also has the negative effect of, I think, being incredibly demoralizing to Democrats to watch the situation we knew was going to happen, happen. And, you know, you had for months Biden being kind of admirably like, this is bullshit. We're not going to deal. And all of a sudden now it's like, you know, McCarthy's going to the White House every day. I mean, that's just a bummer to watch. Yeah. And I do think, I mean, we, we have discussed the very difficult situation they are in. I think Democrats, people who vote for Democrats, have a very, a very reasonable question to ask. And it's basically like this. You are in a very difficult position. We get that. But did you not know you were going to be in this very, very difficult position? Because we knew you were going to be in this very difficult position. So what's the disconnect here? If you're saying we are not going to negotiate, well, that's pretty bold. That's pretty, you know, 
that's balls up, man. That good for you. That is hardcore. But like we no no one else thought Republicans are so they're not gonna negotiate. I guess we gotta give them what they want. Right. So so there there's there's a very good there is a very good question and a very reasonable consternation and being mad about kind of like what did you think was going to happen here that that you know you're 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 you know brandishing a weapon you apparently weren't willing to use so what 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 happened there what was the disconnect there now obviously we don't know how this turns out and that's not just a throwaway line i think one of the things i have seen proposed here is maybe they say maybe in these negotiations they say okay we're also going to pass a budget outline as part of this deal, i.e. that second round you want to have in September where you extort more stuff from us? No, we're not going to do that. And, uh, you know, that's not great, but that at least would be, there would be some, there would, there would be, that that would, um, be some explanation for what they are doing, and it would be not a terrible excuse for what they are doing. Because basically, look at it this way. In a budget negotiation, this is how it works. The the Democrats lost control of the House. That meant, to almost a certainty, that policy would shift back somewhat in a Republican direction. Because you have to get a budget through both chambers of Congress, and they control one chamber of Congress. Um, if you can, if you can kind of diffuse that later one now, because you're negotiating over the debt ceiling again, not great because sets the standard, you know, sets the rules of the road going forward. But that's not that's not nothing. Um, and one other thing to, if they don't do that, one other thing to remember, and th- this shows you why um, why the debt ceiling is not only anachronistic and I think unconstitutional on 14th Amendment grounds, but I think there's actually a decent argument that it is no longer operative law based on the various budget acts that have been passed in the last uh, 50 to 60 years. And here's what I mean by this. Okay, remember the whole government shutdown thing. We've done it three or four times now over the last 30 years, probably more than that if you figure ones that lasted like a day or two. Okay. Under the law, if you don't have a budget, if there's no longer any, like the government has to literally shut down, go out of business, right? Because there's no money appropriated. They've got a system for that. Certain things that are considered non-essential shut down. And that's based, I mean, it's a lot of things that affect a lot of people, but they are things that most of us who don't work for the government or have various sorts of immediate needs from the government don't notice that much. If you're a federal employee, it's a big deal. You get furloughed, right? You're not getting a paycheck. Uh, National parks close or whatever. But basic spending stuff, continues, the military continues, all the sort of the social insurance uh, category spending, all of it continues. Now, how does that happen? There's no budget. It just rolls over. They say, what we were doing last time, just we're just going to continue it until... You... So basically, the government is on autopilot, right? Now, the, the um, and that's because you have a situation where Okay, you didn't come up with a budget, but clearly we still have a country and and whatever. So again, it just rolls over. Based on based on what or authorization? None. So the idea that you have this debt ceiling thing that if you don't increase it, you say, "Oh, okay. We have to actually like shut the government, like shut it down and and just have everything go haywire. That's that's nonsense. And 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 the the debt ceiling, the debt ceiling. How the government does budgeting 
changed radically in the late 20th century, right? This whole thing of reconciliation bills and these overarching budgets and then different parts of, you know, spend all this kind of stuff. It's very complicated. Um, it used to just be, you know, okay, we're going to go out and, you know, ask some people to give us some money if we're, if we're running a deficit or kind of we're going to have a new tax and we're going to get that money and we're going to, um, you know, buy a battleship with it. I mean, it was very rudimentary. And the debt ceiling is from that era. And it's just kind of kicking around. Um, again, I think it is no, there's a very good case. In addition to its being unconstitutional and unwise, if you have one law, okay, law X, and you have another law that says now we are doing law Y, not X, but Y. X is gone. It doesn't need to be unconstitutional. It's overruled. There's a new law that that it can't operate. This one can't operate if this one's still here. It's kind of like that. But uh, back to the back to the debt ceiling. You know, look, we don't know what's gonna. The, we don't know what's the gonna last come thing out I want to say on this is, you know, you, I think you wrote about this, Josh. But the idea that Democrats were in a position last congressional term to kind of address the debt ceiling unilaterally um, before Republicans took over the House. And we talked about this before, the idea that um, Repub or Democrats didn't want to be saddled with kind of Republican attack ads of they jacked the debt up to $6 trillion or, or whatever, even though that's obviously disingenuous and not what the debt ceiling is, and that they felt um, – you know, ruffled at the idea that this is just kind of a basic congressional duty that Democrats are once again being asked to be the only adults in the room on. Um, and then you have the the additional factors of like Mansion and Cinema being difficult all the time and being very likely to kind of buy the Republican bullshit that this is, you know, out of control government spending, blah, blah, blah. And that there might have been some other people as well who like the idea of being, you know, fiscally responsible and and using this to whatever pare back spending. Um, all of that being said, and those I think were active and real obstacles to dealing with this through reconciliation, there was not a big effort to move any of those things, to change any of those conditions. You know, I was asking about this up there at the time. The idea of, you know, hiking the debt ceiling to such limits that you just you know, you remove Republicans' weapon. And this was something that most people were not even, like, thinking about or were not even really aware of as a, a potential idea, which just shows that there was no concerted White House or Senate leadership push to kind of gain any momentum behind this this idea, to see if you could move any of these obstacles before we got to this point. So, you know, I, I want to be fair to Democrats that I think they're in a horrible position and it's mostly Republicans' fault and it's basically never covered like that or, you know, it, it, almost entirely Republicans' fault. But there was a window where they could have avoided this and they could have dealt with it proactively, perhaps, if they could have. And maybe Manchin and Cinema were unmovable. We've seen them be unmovable about a lot of stuff. But they're just there wasn't a concerted effort to even try at that time. Yeah, I mean, my view is a is a little different on this. Just as a point of emphasis, I think you know, and and we were, I was, you know, kind of banging the gong on this that they have to do it. And I think I think the best explanation of this, of the dynamics, and it's a pretty sobering and disappointing explanation, uh, came from this guy Adam Gentleson. What my point is not to make excuses for them because again i was saying you got to do this and they didn't do it so i was you know i'm with you i'm totally with you but some people kind of come up with this idea they looked at it and they just decided they made a decision we don't want to do it we don't want to do this and that's 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 not what happened and and it, it's always good to be in reality as just on general principles but there's an additional plus side in this case that if you convince yourself of something like that, you really do start thinking like, are they insane? Like maybe they really wanted this, this debt ceiling hostage taking, or maybe they want spending caps because why wouldn't they do it? Well, it was something, it was very similar to, you know, why didn't they get rid of the filibuster? 
Well, because they didn't have the votes to do it. That's why. And I think the the basic reason nothing came of it is that you know no one no one ever wants to do this on their own because again you get hit with attack ads blah 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 blah. but in this case it was pretty clear that they were not going to succeed because they didn't have the votes and they basically almost certainly didn't have the votes of mansion and cinema who a aren't going to want to do it on sort of centristy let's not let's that's not fair that's not you know there's one way you could have maybe done this with reconciliation or you'd have a filibuster you know on those kind of filibustery grounds but they're also the kind of people who say hey we do need to get we do need to get spending under control this will be a time we can all get down together and have the grand bargain and what jenelson said is that there're probably like a couple others who don't like that don't like the hostage taking but they're people who, for ideological reasons and for ego reasons, if there's going to be a grant bargain, I want to be part of it. So, you know, it's super bad, but like maybe it'll be an opportunity to have a grand bargain. And so, you know, it's you know, you're not going to succeed. So you're like, why are we going to run up that hill and sort of like, you know. I'm everything for raising the debt ceiling and getting all the attack ads when it's not even going to work. Now, my feeling was if there's 2% chance it's going to work, you got to try because because the alternative is so fucking catastrophic. You have to try. And I think Jenelson was good on explaining here that it is just a risk averse clubby group. And who's going to be the person who's going to say, okay, it's, very likely not going to work. We don't have the votes. But I, Josh, am going to go before the media, put all of you in a bind, and say, we are going to do this. We are going to demand that Mansion and Cinema join us. Who wants to be that person? Now, as I said in a post, if you're a senator listening to this and you're like, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. Well, you suck. Because why, why are you there? If you if you if you suck that much, um, but if you're a listener, it's just important to understand that dynamic because otherwise, if you if you think wow they just they could have just passed it and they decided not to well again that's not what happened they they decided not to try because they knew it was almost certainly not going to succeed and that sucks but that's different. The three big missteps here to me are that situation that they didn't even kind of use it to like lay the groundwork for Republicans are always terrorists with this and we're going to try to avert this. But you pay attention because when this happens, it's going to get blamed on us and it's Republicans and we're going to be out there talking about it before anyone else is Uh, just to kind of like wrap that into your point, which I think is a really good one. I think the second misstep was conflating no negotiation with and he doesn't Kevin McCarthy doesn't even have a budget because that did create a situation that when he did come up with you know some kind of vague outline of spending priorities the natural next step of that conversation is okay he he provided some kind of a budget right so now are you going to negotiate I think the coupling of that was unnecessary and almost just like an attempt to do an extra little like victory lap on the dysfunction of Republicans that ended up putting Democrats in a weaker position than they would have been if they just stuck to the no negotiation line and I think the third misstep is I I just think it's insane to have Biden go out there and to any degree sound amenable to adding work requirements to benefit programs because that is such a piece of like a bygone Clinton era Democratic Party, which doesn't really exist anymore and um, which is just such an alienating position to constituents and to lawmakers. And it really does jack up the the real and covered dysfunction of the party and its lawmakers. So those to me are kind of the three uh, missteps so far. And at this point, you know, we're kind of racing towards June the 1st. And if that deadline holds, you know, if there's no kind of extension of the debt limit, then it's just, I, th- it, I mean, 
as anybody's guess, you know, what yeah. happens next. I think we we talked about this last pod, but it is kind of seeming to me that the the constitutional argument kind of throw it to the courts and let the Supreme Court be blamed if it doesn't work seems almost like the the most positive path that Democrats can take at this point. No, I, I think that is that's why I was so disappointed when when Biden made that comment of, you know, I've been looking at the 14th Amendment. Sounds good, but there's not enough time because it would have to be litigated. Well, man, that is that is so that is so that is so messed up and so wrong and so so inaccurate, but also just not understanding the world we are living in. The fact that there's no time is a feature, not a bug. The whole point is you say, okay, we're doing this. And, you know, take one of the suits of the million right-wingers who step up and say this is unconstitutional. Let's, let's, let's litigate it today in the Supreme Court. You want to, Supreme Court, you want to sort of force us into default? Go for it. And I don't think they will go for it because I don't think they want to take that on themselves. Maybe they will. Then you find out, whatever. Um, but 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 the idea, but beyond that, not understanding the that that's sort of the strategy to kind of stick them with it and force them to make a decision. Since obviously you can't litigate it, you can't say, well, let's let's play it out for six months when you need the money right now. Also. You can't say, okay, we'll let it continue and then we'll litigate because you can't sell bonds that say like, okay, here is a here is a uh, U.S. Treasury bond. The Supreme Court is currently considering whether you'll get paid back for it. I mean, so you stick it with them. But the broader point is if you were still in the mode of like, oh, we're, gonna, we're in this high stakes negotiation and we're just going to kind of allow the Supreme Court to kind of sit on something for a year, you're not living in the real world. What's going on here? So I, you know, that was the kind of, that in my, in my mind, that attitude is worse than negotiating. Because, you know, we all say like, you you don't negotiate with terrorists. People negotiate with terrorists all the time, all the time. You don't necessarily give them the ransom you know, someone takes over a bank and they've got a bunch of hostages in there, you bring in a hostage negotiator, right? We say that, but it's usually, it's usually not the case. Or in other cases, you negotiate and then you ambush them later, right? If you want to d- draw out the terrorism analogy. But uh, sometimes you have to talk and see and to kind of get yourself past a bind because it's a bad situation and the consequences are too serious to be left to chance but that attitude of like oh it'll take a take a long time to li- to litigate when there is no time and you're dealing with with bad faith actors over there so th- the the point of sticking it to them is to say yeah they suck and they're not they're not you know neutral arbiters playing balls and sh- you know kind of calling balls and strikes but they also have their interests at stake and we don't think they are going to take it on themselves about, okay, we have found this new, uh, you know, uh, bond readiness doctrine, which means we have to strike, you know, go for it. You take it on yourself. Yeah. I mean, and the last thing I'll say about this before we move on is just like even content aside of the the legal strategy here, it's active, it's creative, and it gets you out of a situation where you're like so beholden to, you know, Kevin McCarthy, like the weakest speaker who's getting to make calls on par with the president of the United States. I mean, it's just, it's a way out. Um, Okay. So now we're going to talk about- Let me say one thing, you know, Napoleon, attack, attack, attack. You, you can, you simply cannot see the initiative to the other side. You have to be doing things. Um, and that really does, that trumps all the other questions, really. You have to maintain the initiative. So George Santos and the, you know, the newest kind of uh, episode here is he was charged, arraigned, what, that was last week? 
I think, and yeah, now, yeah, last and, week, just last week. Uh, and now uh, Democrats are kind of moving to force a vote to expel him from the chamber. Now, this will almost certainly not work. It'll almost certainly not come to a vote. You need two-thirds of members to expel Santos, so that would require a lot of Republican buy-in. Um, and the thing is, you have, like, uh, particularly the Republicans of the New York delegation have been very public with, you know, this guy needs to resign. Obviously, he's bad for their brand, right? Um, but as we've discussed, you know, ad nauseum, McCarthy needs Santos. If he leaves, it's going to be a Democrat in that seat, and he can't afford to have his margin shrink by even one person. Um, so Republicans could vote to table this. Uh, they could kind of boot it to the the House Ethics Committee, which is what McCarthy is suggesting that he wants to happen. Um, who I think is funny because their uh, kind of like charge at that point is to discover whether Santos did this wrongdoing, which, you know, a jury just said that he did do. Um, so, you know, there this probably won't come to a vote. Democrats clearly think it's and I think they're right. It's good for them to at least force Republicans to kind of dance away from it to show that they are reluctant to get rid of this guy. Um, the same way that I think kind of uh, making a new cycle out of each of his scandals is good for Democrats. Well, isn't there what what walk us through the procedural issue here? I assume there is a there is a procedural vote that we assume Democrats will lose and there and then there's not the vote to expel, but there's going to be voting, right? Yeah, that's right. And so is it the is it the procedural vote that's two thirds, then the expel? Like walk us through the, the expulsion the is two thirds. Um, I th I think the pro proceeding to that is just a majority. Right. Um, right. But yeah, either way, I mean, McCarthy's already kind of like talking a lot about the ethics committee being like, you know, there, there's a due process and other people have served in the house while being investigated for crimes. Right. So, Well, th this goes back to what we said before, which is that there is a lot of people just pack it in when they're indicted, but there's certainly an argument that, hey, an indictment is just an accusation. I'm innocent. I deserve to defend myself. You have no basis to kick me out. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. And that makes, and that there, there's a lot of merit to that way of looking at it, but it really doesn't apply to Santos because he's guilty of so many things. You know, there, there, there's like the, 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 the federal government, the justice department just picked a few of them to indict him on. Like what happened to the dog? Right. The dog who he swindled out of three thousand dollars of 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 medical. I mean, there's so many things that it's sort of a a an embarrassment and an absurdity that he's that he's still there. I will say this. Obviously, they want the vote to say you voted to keep George Santos in the House. And this is the one thing I agree with you going back to our earlier conversation. I agree with you, Kate, about hanging so much on they don't have a budget yet created this thing that created this dynamic in which when um Kevin McCarthy I'm not sure how much he surprised everyone it wasn't that anybody thought it was impossible they just thought it would be hard and he might not be able to do it that when he did do it there was this kind of wave of like oh Kevin Kevin put his cards on the table. You got to you got to deal with him now. But there there is something else that Democrats were trying to get there. They wanted everyone in that caucus to vote for what the Freedom Caucus was going to demand. And they got that. And that is something that they are all going to be running on in 2024. And that's not nothing. They got to I mean they just got those people to to vote to cut everything cut all sorts of stuff, all the, all the, um, all the subsidies, all the, all the spending in your district. So they didn't, they, there was something else they were trying to get, um, in addition to, uh, you know, that strategic issue. And they got that. So it's not nothing just to make the point in the same sense that, you know, they're trying to set up a, an embarrassing test boat now over Santos. Right. Yeah. And the Santos thing to me also, you know, goes in the category of when, uh, 
the House stripped Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar of their committees, right? Like they knew Republicans wouldn't vote for it at that time. It didn't matter because Democrats had the majority. But it also does the work of, okay, so this is the face of your party. Like this is the guy uh, or the, you know, the woman that you are rallying behind that you are protecting. Uh, This is who Republicans are. And that works well for Democrats because that I think is going to be the crux of the kind of overarching 2024 narrative, which is Republicans for, you know, any, any reason, the anti-democracy stuff, the abortion stuff, like Republicans are extremists and they will uh, kind of, gather behind one of their own, even when it's someone as patently ridiculous as George Santos. And, and the the other, th- you know, it's it's one of these kind of silly things, but it is how the world works that, you know, the vast majority of people have no idea what this debt ceiling thing is about or all these kind of technicalities we talk about, like work require People hear work requirements. And they think, I work. <laughs> Why shouldn't there be work requirements? We're giving you money, and you're not, and you refuse to work. I mean, just on its face, that makes a lot of sense, and to to a lot of people. And 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 if you don't know more, it just makes sense. Period. What they don't know is like, okay, well, this person is on disability and can't hold down a job because they need the medical care, which is why they're on Medicaid. So they can't work. Or this is a, a woman with three children who can't afford ch- all, all the stuff we know. But the thing is with Santos, you do polls and like 95% of the people in the country know about George Santos and know what a ridiculous person he is. So that, even though it is, it's just sort of frivolous and incredibly enjoyable absurdity, those things have traction. Because you do an ad and, you know, that kind of that who, you know, who, who makes all the money because they have that voice where they say like, <laughs> and then Kate voted to keep <laughs> George Santos in office, but uh, letting down all Americans because George Santos is so ridiculous. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's that that gets you because you're like, you voted to keep George Santos, that ridiculous person. What do you you know, what are you what are you what are you thinking? Exactly. So that matters. Yep. Okay, and now to round it off, we're just to do a little kind of court update corner here. Uh, the Supreme Court took up a case on Monday out of South Carolina, where basically, um, you know, all redistricting cases have to start at a panel of three district level judges. This case went to them. They found that Republicans had, quote, exiled thousands of black voters from the first congressional district in South Carolina, basically to put them all into Jim Clyburn's district. So there's only like, you know, and we've discussed this before. So you have a district that is almost, you know, as close to a lock for Democrats as possible. And then Republicans get all the other seats, right? Make all those other ones non-competitive by just shoving all the Democrats into one district. This is called packing. Um, and so the dis- the the panel of judges found like, you can't do this. This is obviously a gerrymander. Uh, you you can't disenfranchise all these voters. And all, and this gerrymander that they did came on the heels of the first congressional district was under Republican control for 40 years. And then in 2018, a Democrat named Joe Cunningham flipped it. Huge upset at the time. Uh, the next cycle, 2020, Nancy Mace won it back, but by like one percentage point. You know, this was a real swing district in every definition of the term. So then last year, when the South Carolina Republicans are finishing up redistricting, they get all the black voters out of this district. Lo and behold, in 2022, Nancy May sails to reelection by 14 points. So they completely remade this district. Okay, so this panel finds that to be a gerrymander, uh, orders them to redraw this district to, you know, restore some balance here. Um, This gets appealed. And now the Supreme Court on Monday agreed to take up this challenge by the South Carolina Republicans to the order that they redraw the district, which includes such questions as um, did the district court err by tying ra- uh, racial racial dynamics so closely to, you know, nonpartisan Jerry? I mean, r- like ridiculous things like that, um, <laughs> which overall, this is just another sign of 
you know, a court that has been historically damaging to the traditional kind of legal safeguards that stop this kind of egregious gerrymandering, probably gearing up to do another, uh, you know, add another data point to that column, that that grand legacy of the Roberts court. Um, but an interesting wrinkle here as well is that ProPublica put out this piece showing that Clyburn participated in these efforts to, you know, reconfigure the districts because for him, that just means an influx of Democratic voters, right? Yeah. I mean, that, his seat is safe. And well, I how, guess it's like, how, don't worry about it. Yeah. How safe do we know what it I mean, it's funny, you know, because there's a there's a complicated history here where I, I, I don't remember the exact years, but basically um, in the, you know, kind of 80s, basically, in the the the, the sort of uh, not the not the second wave, but as the legal repercussions of a lot of what happened during the civil rights movement and the updated Civil Rights Act came in, you know, came into um, sort of came into effect. You had these uh, minority majority districts where you have uh, people in the civil rights movement in 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 voting rights saying you can't keep dividing up the bl the black people into all these districts so they don't really have any power anywhere and then you have the first creation of these major these minority majority districts and then at a certain point republicans say wait a second awesome let's pack them all into just a few districts and we'll go back on having and then we'll have all the rest right um now, so th there's that history with Clyburn. I would have assumed that that district was that he was plenty safe already, which makes it, you know, kind of uh, kind of suspect. Um, uh, I would I'll say it was getting less safe. There had been it used to be kind of a black majority district, right, okay. but there had been a pretty significant exodus of those voters from his district. Okay, so, so he needed the help, maybe packed his margins. Yeah, right. Okay, so so yeah, I mean that that these these uh, these self interest um, self interest comes into play, and maybe he'd have an argument, kind of like actually. You know, maybe after I retire, there there wouldn't be an African American representative here, and there's like no way. So you know, maybe it's more. Mm -hmm. um, there there certainly is a aside from these kind of egregious actions, there are certainly real trade offs that you have that you can see disagreements. Between people who are are you know have have are, are operating in 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 good faith and and wanting the best representation and all that kind of stuff, that if you want uh you know if you want to have two or three Democratic districts in that state, they're not going to be super safe. Mm -hmm. You know where does that and and maybe you'll have no no African American re uh, representation in um in the whole South Carolina delegation. I think everybody would agree who doesn't suck that would that would not be great you know because even even though it's one th the state is has a a very big minority of Af african american voters and it would it would be sort of absurd on the merits and very bad in representation so you know all the all these things come into me any case I, I we digress from the court case right so uh they took that up that'll come down the pike you know, I don't, I, it would be a pretty enormous shock if they don't reverse the lower court there. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to flag for listeners is today, Wednesday, the 17th, um, in a bit, a bit later this afternoon, the fifth circuit court of appeals is going to start, is going to hear the oral arguments on the big Mifepristone case. This is the one that came up from Cax Merrick that he tried to do in private that, you know, we helped break the news about what was going on there. And then, um, it, it already did go to like a preliminary panel of the Fifth Circuit who basically handed down a, a favorable ruling for the anti-abortion side, but the Supreme Court swooped in and paused that, and now the Fifth Circuit is having a whole full briefing on the merits. So, you know, I don't 
think it's a super bold prediction to think that their ultimate decision will probably come out more or less looking like what the panel did at the beginning. And this will end up at the Supreme Court like we've always expected it to. Uh, But those arguments are going to happen this afternoon. And that's the next kind of big event in terms of all these various fights over, uh, you know, the abortion pill that are kind of swirling around on, on all different levels of the court system right now. Now, do we do we have a sense of what the what the timeline is for that decision? Is that something we expect in relatively short order? Or is that something that's like, you know, going to be five months from now? Probably short order. Um, There's been kind of attempts to like expedite this at every level. Um, and, And the thing to keep in mind, though, is that that administrative stay that the Supreme Court handed down, kind of freezing all these lower court decisions, that stay is good until they either decide not to take the case up or they take the case up and hand down their own ruling. So there is, to some degree, kind of like a safety net until the Supreme Court gets involved here for real, no matter what the Fifth Circuit does at this point. Got it. Okay. So I guess that, I guess we're, that, have we covered all the court stuff that we need to Yeah, to discuss? that's everything. So okay. just a reminder to our listeners, since I messed this up last time. As, uh, Are you Josh promising not to be here you. next week? Are you promising? <laughs> promising. So next okay. week is our evergreen episode, which is interesting. We got into a lot of the um, kind of dynamics percolating at the state level, which is something that kind of intersects with our episodes, but we don't often get to kind of dive deep into the state house stuff. Um, and then the next week we're off and then the next week I am back and we are back to normal. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so that is the plan. And remember the uh, Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's cold brew Ice coffee. Uh, you can get 25% off on any purchase at Grady's cold brew.com with promo code TPM. And I think that is it for us for this week and for the next for the, oh, I won't even get into it again. I don't want to complicate it <laughs> about the next couple right. of weeks. But there you go. See you All right. Soon. See ya. The Josh Marshall Podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter Kate Riga, and TPM founder, editor-in-chief Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to Why Not Jan Spell for our podcast theme song. And thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen.